This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. It's so nice, I can just say what I want to say, as opposed to what I can say. I come to the afterlife of Plutarch less from a primary research interest in Plutarch than as someone working on the history of scholarship, especially in its modern post-mid-18th century disciplinary shape. That said, I find myself advising two doctoral theses at the moment, which deal in in its entirety or in part with Plutarch as Plutarch. I have also had the experience of teaching Plutarch as part of a graduate seminar on biography, and it has been the supervising and teaching experience that has made me look at the field of Plutarchan studies and its bibliography and its perception as a bit of an outsider. What what that has taught me is, I'm sure, nothing new to most of you, that there has been a kind of stepmotherly treatment of him, thanks to his perception, including in very good classics departments, as as of someone who who writes on everything and is interesting enough, though not the sort of deeply original um, writer, a a sort of small-c conservative down-to-earth writer, once famous and popular for the Parallel Lives and the Moralia, um, but now also newly on the map of imperial literature. Someone, though, I think who for classicists, and that seems to me the sort of perception I I get, is considered useful to have as a source, though hardly canonical or essential to read for the pleasure of its own sake. That said, I also had the experience, which I hopefully share with most or all of you, that when you actually teach Plutarch and make students read Plutarch, it's a great success. Now, there is a relatively clear genealogy of Plutarch's fate in the modern period that we tell ourselves, namely that after close attention to Plutarch, especially in in antiquity in the humanist tradition, and a peak of popularity in the 17th and 18th centuries, by way of Amiot's popular translation and its retranslation by Norse, Shakespeare and Montaigne to Rousseau, Schiller, and the American Founding Fathers, his impact on intellectual and cultural history history continually waned, thanks to changing notions of scholarly historiography, exemplarity, and Plutarch's own value as a historical source. This is a genealogy that we find, and this is likely the source for most of us, in scholarly works. A good example, to which I will return below, is the long uh, Pauli Visova article on Plutarch by Konrad Ziegler from 1951, which includes a section on his afterlife and was essentially a freestanding monograph in its depth and detail and is still an extremely useful source considered a standard bibliographical reference for all things Plutarchan. By and large, this genealogy of the modern Plutarch appears to be an accurate trajectory. And the pre-modern and early modern aspects of it have been and are increasingly well studied, as we've seen in the last day and a half. The fate of Plutarch after 1800 and his relative disappearance from public life into unsympathetic scholarship has been more confidently claimed, yet less studied in detail. The aim of this paper here is to begin to offer, to begin to offer a commentary specifically on the scholarly attitude towards Plutarch after 1800, in the context of an increasingly institutionalized discipline, not least because by the turn of the 21st century, now, and by the time of his recent academic rehabilitation, it is still largely as an object of classical scholarship that Plutarch is read, perceived, and evaluated. This is, after all, the Plutarch we have inherited for revision. As I said, this historiography of Plutarchan reception comes to us from classical scholarship itself. What classicists have always stressed, no matter their affinity, is the distinction between an academic readership and an extra-academic popular one. Itself a distinction that is revealing about the position of specialist scholarship in its institutional and disciplinary shape. As I said, I think the story of Plutarch's relative visibility before and disappearance after 1800 is by and large accurate. But if we look at the details of how this genealogy is told, we find a range of reasons that have as much or more to do with the genesis and self-definition of modern classical scholarship as they do with the content of Plutarch. Reasons that go beyond the standards of a new historical or historicist criticism that found Plutarch wanting. I will therefore begin to sketch an outline of the map of Plutarchan scholarship, or rather only a sector of the map, 
Since I will be talking mostly about Plutarch as a biographer, beginning in the first half of the 20th century and looking back from there. The volume of essays on Plutarch's parallel lives, which Barbara Scardilli edited in 1995, opens with Vilamovic's piece on Plutarch as biographer, originally published in 1922. To me, it seems in many ways to sum up the fate of Plutarch in the 19th century as a century that shaped a great deal of scholarly orthodoxies and research agendas. In its explicit statements and in its unspoken assumptions, it is an extremely interesting piece, since it apparently rescues Plutarch from the charges leveled against him by the historians, insisting instead on his role as a biographer. Vilamovic reminds the reader, Pace the historians, of the literary coherence and artistic structures of the bios as a genre, which is emphatically far from being a historical chronology. And I suppose this is the main reason why Vilamovic's piece is in the collection, with pride of place, where it is arranged chronologically. Thus, he vindicates a more systematic Plutarch and praises his essential Greekness and broadly understood loyalty to the Romans as much as to an image of classicism and Hellenism, which he himself, as Vilamovic sees, helped to create. At the same time, the short piece seems to be no less an exercise in damning with faint praise. Plutarch is Hellenic. That is to say, he is more Hellenic than all the others of his time. But he's not original. For Vilamovic, he's better than Pausanias, but then given his dislike for Pausanias, this is not exactly a compliment either. He is Platonic, but he's Platonic in a practical, domesticated sense. He is wissenschaftlich, but in the sense of the genial amateur, appreciated and upright, representing the values of diligence, tüchtigkeit, education, Bildung, and enjoying a good reputation and a certain material comfort, the equivalent of someone who has enjoyed a good classical education and knows how to make the best of it. The essay falls into three sections. A biographical description of Plutarch himself and of his character as a writer. Secondly, a genealogy of his genre of bios and comparison with other kinds of ancient biographical writing earlier, contemporary and later. And a last third that is essentially about the limitations of Plutarch. As Vilamovic says, there's plenty to praise in him as a narrator and biography, biographer, even though it is precisely in his role as biographer that we feel most pressingly the narrow confines imposed in Hellenic biography. This last, relatively long section articulates a grievance Vilamovic is expressing in other publications as well, namely that Greek writing, with few exceptions, had not understood individuality, properly speaking. The chief limitation of Greek biography, which is also that of much other Greek writing, is that it looks for the same, the same human across time and regardless of context and context-dependent values. This is not to say that Vilamovic is presenting a kind of relativist, post-humanistic approach. Instead, it means that what he chiefly misses is due emphasis on character development. That is to say, a specific understanding of temporality and of narrative that distinguishes an essentially modern conception of individuality. So Plutarch's and everyone, everybody else's individuality just does not look like 18th century individuality and 19th century. As the literary scholar Fortis Janidis, contemporary scholar, has put it for German 18th and 19th century literature, individuality could only be articulated in terms of development. Now, Plutarch in Vilamovic's description draws characters very well, which is what the bios as a genre is exactly about, the well-rounded account of a life as a coherent attitude. And much as he draws from the peripatetics and from Aristotle for Vilamovic, he never condescends to simple labeling. So this is Vilamovic's positive evaluation of Plutarch. And yet, and this is a, a grave fault for him, quote, it never even occurred to him to describe the character's actual becoming. Uh, ihr, ihr Werden darzustellen kommt ihm gar nicht in den Sinn. As I said, this is a part of a bone which Vilamovic has to pick with all of Greek literature. Despite flashes of insight into and expression of individuality in archaic poetry, and with the big exception of Greek tragedy 
and sort of despite himself, Plato, despite Plato, Plato, there is a lack of understanding individuality as personality. Um, I've put a, a longer quotation on your handout, which I'm not going to read in full, uh, which comes from a review by Wilamowitz in 1907 of Georg Misch's first volume of the History of Autobiography, where he makes the same point. And this is really to show you, I mean, there he makes it very forcefully. And interestingly, he doesn't even begin to talk about Plutarch in there. Uh, but this is to show you that this is really a sort of a topic that we find like a red thread through a lot of Wilamowitz's writing. That, um, you know, with the exception of, um, w with few exceptions, um, Greek writing has really not understood individuality. In the Plutarch piece, by contrast, and in the, the Misch review, uh, Plato is portrayed briefly, though in much greater detail elsewhere, of course. Villamoz writes very extensively about, Plu about Plato, not least he publishes a 500-page biography of Plato. Um, Plato is portrayed as the philosopher who had the power and talent as a poet to describe and to create the characters and individualities of men, but who sublimated them to the realm of forms. This is in the, in the essay on Plutarch as a biographer. And I will return to the importance of Plato in a little. This is just to sort of continue a, a quick summary of, of this um, essay by Wilamowitz that has been very frequently quoted. And even if we probably think of, if we think of Wilamowitz as an ardent defender of Greekness and Greek writing, which he is, he presents us in the Plutarch essay with a genealogy where a kind of new freshness of character and individuality arrives with the Macedonians as a kind of overwhelming vital force, and with the roughness, or what he calls Knorrigkeit, of Roman personality. He finishes his piece with a brief comparison between Plutarch and Tacitus as a portraitist of Roman character, and he closes what started as a piece ostensibly in defense of Plutarch as a biographical artist, with the opinion that the outstanding artist will always maintain his superior status and it's really not clear from the syntax here whether he means by the superior artist Plutarch or Tacitus or the superior artist in general, but it's not obviously Plutarch. In any case, the superior artist will prevail. But even historical scholarship will eventually change its judgment, and what it seeks in Plutarch is in any case only part of what can be found in him. Behind this remains the amiable citizen of Chironea, who continues to invite us into his hospitable home, where he will tell us many, many a thing about men and gods over local Boeotian wine. And finally, he will point to the lion, that faithful guardian over the earthly tomb of the old immortal greatness of Greece. Now, this is the often quoted tag about Plutarch as a genial host and chatty raconteur, not without political and social savvy, but essentially a busy provincial writer of many turns. It comes as part of a belief that the overly strict historicists might want to modify their opinion, which had been characterized by Wilamowitz as too extreme anyway, but he nonetheless positions Plutarch firmly within a history of biographical writing in which he sort of shows some promise but is overall relegated to the good but not the very good. This is not the end of the piece. Wilamowitz continues his map of biographical writing and Greek attitudes by looking ahead to the advent of real insight into individuality as inner development with the early Christian writers and especially Augustine. Wilamowitz points out, and this is his final point towards which most of the essay now seems to have been tending, that traces of such modern, more inward looking and developmental individuality may have existed already in the imperial period, even if they were not clearly articulated. The task of the modern scholar, therefore, to unearth those traces and make them explicit, which, as he says in his final, somewhat abrupt sentence, has been his own intention in a sketch of Aristides. And on this note ends the piece. He says, in this field, there remains much to be done, and to point this out was the main purpose of this sketch, this essay on Plutarch. In the meanwhile, I have tried to develop this myself in the case of Aristides. That's the end of the essay. The way Wilamowitz frames his essay, then, is by beginning with an indictment of historical criticism, 
or rather historicist zeal, and by finishing with the confident expression of belief that it is the discipline of philology itself that has the power to restore Plutarch to his proper place. As he puts it, while it was historical criticism that had done such damage to Plutarch, it is also Wissenschaft that, quote, will heal the wounds it has afflicted. Not least, though, it is Wilamowitz himself, as the quasi-personification of Wissenschaft, who sets about rescuing Plutarch, first by giving a biographical and coherent account of his, Plutarch's, developing character as a biographer, and then by putting him within a larger genealogy of biographical writing, a kind of biography of biography. It is remarkable how much Wilamowitz is actually putting himself center stage in such a way that Plutarch himself is by the end almost occluded in favor of Wilamowitz's own work on Aristides. To understand Plutarch as a biographer, in fact, we hardly need Plutarch, but we certainly need Wilamowitz. His misgivings about Plutarch, which are pegged to his expectations about individuality, betray a larger phenomenon, though, which I like to think can exemplify and explain, at least to an extent, the relative disappearance of Plutarch as a prominent writer for classical scholars, or rather their relative, relative disregard about his importance. And this is, in short, that it is Plato in the modern period who takes over the position of Plutarch as a pedagogical model and as a canonical writer who can fulfill the function of encouraging reflection and intellectual advance together with offering precepts for the moral self. And so in other words, to come back to the papers we heard yesterday about the sort of self-fashioning of the, of the Plutarchan reader or scholar, the need for finding an identity identificatory figure sort of, of the educator, the, the need does not go away in the 19th century, but it shifts away from Plutarch to other figures such as especially Plato. Wilamowitz makes the point, as do Konrad Ziegler and Rudolf Hirzel in a 1912 monograph on Plutarch and his afterlife, which Ziegler used in great detail, that modern scholarship, meaning the discipline arising out of the German neo-humanist tradition that began with Winkelmann and Humboldt, shifted the focus decisively back from a Roman and Greco-Roman world to a Greek one, and to a Greek one that was classical, or at any rate, more original, meaning a return to the sources and classics exemplified by Homer, tragedy, Plato, and Aristotle. In this context, a writer like Plutarch, who is not only late, but also mixes Greek and Roman, is more easily pushed aside in favor of a new canon. Where Hirzel and Ziegler, who are essentially both sympathetic to Plutarch, carefully identify those layers of intellectual history and their ideological preferences, Wilamowitz states his judgments clearly, because in his own essay he says, uh, the other half of Plutarch's writings inevitably, or mo most of them in fact, had to fall into oblivion, not only because time produced new whole systems of philosophy, but also because we finally found our way back to Plato and Aristotle. As a diagnosis, I think, this is more significant that he lets on. Plato moved center stage in the 19th century, but I would submit that this was not only true in terms of the independent development of the study of ancient philosophy, with a new focus on philosophical systems, but more generally in terms of Plato used as a vehicle of self-reflection within the discipline. It is because, we find, it is because the self-understanding of the discipline of classical scholarship is about the individual and its Bildung, that hard to translate term, that I'll just leave as Bildung, education or self-formation is often given, it is because of that that we find a vision of antiquity as a coherent organic self, a quasi-person and personality in its <coughs> own right. Reinhard Koselik, in his work on modern temporality and the modern understanding of history as, as temporalized, has argued that the 18th century saw quite literally in its semantic usage a shift from histories to history with a capital H. This itself frames the fact that the practice of exemplarity, or single significant, of individual significant histories, which is the practice in which Plutarch had been read throughout a good part of earlier centuries, that this sort of 
you know, the, the, the manifold histories now rubbed uncomfortably against an overriding directionality and trajectory of capital H history. But Kozelik argues further that this was part of a general phenomenon of such singularizations in the late 18th century. Histories and capital H history, freedoms or liberties and freedom, etc. One could also include here a shift, even though Kozelik doesn't do that, from the ancients towards a newly prevalent use of antiquity as a favored term. And uh, Catherine Harlow has a forthcoming book on, on Winkelmann and the beginnings of uh, Altertumswissenschaft where I think she makes exactly this point. It is this antiquity, capital A antiquity, as an organic body that reflects the modern individual linking both through this notion of building. Development is now read off antiquity, the development of antiquity in general, and as an act of understanding, it constitutes the modern individual. To find and define the character of antiquity was to describe and recount its life story and to understand and comprehend its wesen, its essence or character or being. Wilhelm von Humboldt, for example, tasked in 1809 with formulating the structure of the new research university at Berlin that would much later bear his name, makes this form of understanding antiquity quite literally the programmatic goal in his essay on the study of antiquity and of Greek antiquity in particular, which is on your handout, where he says, the study of a nation offers all the advantages which history has in general, namely to increase our knowledge of human beings by examples of actions and events, to sharpen our power of judgment, and to improve and raise our character, which in, in some sense still sounds very Plutarchan. You'd think Plutarch could be mapped onto that kind of program. Yet it does more in trying not, to, not only to unravel the thread of successive events, so here's where so Plutarch stops, but rather to explore the condition and the state of the nation altogether, this kind of study give a, gives us a biography, as it were. So in other words, the, the program of, of classics and of studying classical antiquity really is to, to write the biography of capital A antiquity. The question I ask myself is whether within such a horizon a writer like Plutarch became simply too wide-ranging to match the kind of focused and narrative organicism that shaped this neo-humanist outlook and the translation into disciplinary priorities. That alone need not have excluded Plutarch, but I think what changed was the assumption that the work as a whole, so Plutarch's work as a whole, uh, or any ancient work as a whole, or body of works, ought to mirror the same sense of unity. I'm not venturing a judgment here on the absolute structural unity of Plutarch's works, but what seems defensible to me as an argument is that the relative fluidity of the reading practices of Plutarch that preceded the, the modern period, the exemplarity, the emphasis on imitation and on action, as we saw yesterday, had meant that a text was much more open to fragmentation in the sense of re-readings and rewritings that could focus on the single example. And that's what we saw yesterday when people start adding Plutarchan lives. Also, you know, add, adding, sort of mixing and choosing. Within a new regimen that made any identitarian potential for reading Plutarch dependent on the balance between the organic and developmental coherence of the text and of its reader, such earlier models of Plutarchan readings, where you just pick out whatever you like, must have caused resistance and discomfort. In other words, while the focus on the individual, the focus on the individual as a parameter of interpretation could have left a place for Plutarch, the level of expectation about coherence and, devel and development, which we still see so clearly in Villa Movitz, may have shifted the focus and ultimately favored investment in a writer and a body of works such as that of Plato. Now, of course, Plutarch's affinity with Plato through the academy and in his writings had not been a secret. But of the pitting of one against the other in some sense, we might already see an early sign in André Dacier's preface to his Plutarch translation and commentary published in 1721. The Daciers, André Dacier and his wife Anne Dacier, who herself was an accomplished philologist and the author of a very well-known translation of Homer, belong actively to the tail end of the Querelle des Anciens et des Modernes, 
in that sense, André Dacier's Plutarch, too, is situated in a kind of borderland of opposing tendencies. So the, 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 the early modern period. Still part of a world of exemplarity and the royal and aristocratic traditions of mirrors of princes, based at the same time on newly developed philological and critical techniques, conscious of an enlarged sense of history and historicity, and in that sense also looking ahead to the modern period. And what I find very intriguing is that Dacier, who really sort of stands on the cusp here, uh, cites an anecdote about the 15th century humanist Theodore of Gaza, who, when asked whom he would last throw off a ship in a shipwreck, answered Plutarch. Dacier, in this preface to his enormous edition of Plutarch, Dacier, who had devoted almost 30 years to this edition, adds that he himself would throw Plutarch off only as the second to last, the last place ought to belong to Plato. Not least since Plutarch, so he argues, drew the best things about philosophy from his affinity with him. Now, throughout the early modern period, the knowledge of Plato had been increasing, with more text editions, translations, and collections of works. What changes for in the modern period is a much more wholesale investment in establishing a coherent corpus of Platonic writing and of understanding the work to be reflecting the development of the author as philosopher. This was accompanied by a noticeable shift of interest from Socrates as an example, and whatever our judgment of him was an eccentric example, to Plato as a thinker. So I think this is really what, what changes in the modern period. It's not just a new interest in Plato. There had been interest in, in Plato and in Socrates before, but this sort of transition from a very unusual Socrates to sort of Plato as a coherent thinker whose character is reflected in his writings. Together with the rise of classical philology as a discipline, especially in Germany, we see a growing interest in a developmental narrative of Plato as a philosopher and does a desire to establish a developmental order of his works. And so the early 19th century is really sort of the period where you find an awful lot of, of publications on the question of what is the order of the dialogues. We also see certainly in Germany a strong investment in a platonic language of knowledge and knowledge acquisition which filters into the language that is used to circumscribe the task of scholarship. And I'm sort of presenting you a very, very abbreviated argument here, which I'm going to make more fully in the, in the book I'm writing at the moment. We, we can see this sort of in, in new investment in a platonic language of what knowledge is about. Um, for example, uh, in a kind of genealogy that links someone like Schleiermacher, who even if he was not a classical philologist per se, produced the seminal translation of Plato's works, in which he puts pedagogy and scientific dialectic center stage. Schleiermacher's own very influential hermeneutics, a philosophical theory or account of interpretation, owed substantially to a platonic model, and it in turn shaped lastingly the programmatic language of someone like August Burke, who was Schleiermacher's pupil, and whose tenure as chair of classical philology as the at the University of Berlin for almost 50 years exerted influence over several generations of philologists in Germany. As I said, I think it is mostly the privileging of Plato as a figure who can carry identificatory weight for the professionalizing classical philologists that is responsible for the relative invisibility of Plutarch. Some others, so, though some who were trendsetters for the growing discipline even set him more actively aside. One of Friedrich August Wolf's first publications, with a view to school instruction, and the raison d'etre of classical philological seminars, after all, was to educate school teachers. His first edition, or his first published work, was not the Polygamina to Homer, but a commented edition and translation of Plato's Symposium, which Wolf turns into a programmatic text for what education is about. And while he still acknowledges the pedagogical value of Plutarch, he disregards him as a suitable text. As he puts it a little later in his history of Greek literature, if his language were as excellent as his moral views, he would make for a good textbook. But he does not qualify as a text for beginners. And that goes back to the point earlier that the, the, the language was just not attic enough. 
Still, I do not mean to argue for a total eclipse of Plutarch in the 19th century. And this leads me to my last area for now of the very tentative map, namely to the question of what we do not see, especially if we follow the lead of someone like Vila what, what are the roads not taken, or rather the roads not marked on the map of 19th century scholarship? I think there are two kinds of roads. One kind is that which had made Plutarch so popular in the non-academic world and in the non-German world, his ostensible applicability to a contemporary context, that is to say his suitability to address questions of moral and political action. This is the Plutarch all scholars were agreed was the Plutarch of the past, the author of portraits of political and public men and their actions that appealed to Montaigne, Shakespeare and Rousseau, but more importantly still to the French revolutionaries and to German writers like Schiller. It really has been a commonplace in German scholarship to mention Schiller's character Karl Mohr in his useful and revolutionary-minded play The Robbers, who pits the vigor of Plutarchan heroes against the malaise of his own tintenklecksende seculum, his sort of ink-stained uh, century. But this sort of token reference to Schiller shows up the thin line between comfort and, discom and discomfort with that kind of revolutionary Plutarch. Um, be between acknowledgement of Schiller on the one hand, who especially by the end of the 19th century had become a German classic and the stable part of the cultural canon, and a certain cautiousness vis-a-vis -vis revolutionary sympathies. This is not at all to suggest that Plutarch is a fundamentally radical or revolutionary writer, but it is important to remember the tradition of conflating some of his characters and himself, at least in perception. What is more, so Plutarch, the revolutionary writer, was something a lot of 19th century scholars, I think, wanted to be careful about and wanted to stay clear of in a general, generally sort of more conservative political climate um, after the Napoleonic Wars. What is more, Plutarch was a writer championed by the French, and this itself could put him into a more difficult position for a 19th century German academic readership especially as the century wore on. For an academic readership, in addition, whose members were civil servants, who were as such, by professional protocol, discouraged or not allowed to express political opinions in their function as university teachers and researchers. So in other words, this kind of the, the, the model um, which uh, Fred Schuring mentioned yesterday of the... Uh, Plutarch as the scholar and, not quite statesman, but Plutarch as the scholar and political counselor sort of begins to break down because y you're not supposed to be a man of political action when you're a German university professor. And in, in many ways, really sort of by, by the constitution of your, of your contract, you're not in a position where you're supposed to put forward political opinion. Now, if this, the, the public or political Plutarch is a kind of road not indicated on the map for cultural and institutional reasons, another kind less explored is the continued interest, which is there in the 19th century, by some German philologists, mostly by German textual critics. What are the questions that were put to Plutarch? Now, if we look, for example, at Ziegler's extensive bibliographical research account in the Pauli Visova article, it is clear that there is Plutarchan scholarship, though with different priorities. For one, there was an emphasis on the chronology of the lives, as well as on the historiography of biography itself. Um, maybe exempli sort of exemplified uh, at the end of the century or the, the turn of the century by Friedrich Leo and the question of origins of biography. So again, the sort of, as in Wilamowitz, the, the emphasis shifts from biographies to biography with a capital B again, and a sort of writing a kind of biography of biography. Um, an agenda that is not surprising in light of the importance of creating narrative unity and developmental trajectories. Likewise, as you all know, there was a great interest in Plutarch in terms of source criticism, of establishing Plutarch's own sources, and of using his texts as sources in turn. This is the familiar story of the fragmented the fragmented Plutarch mined for information by the historians, including the limitations of this approach. 
if we look at the amount of text editions, translations and references, so if we read someone like Ziegler carefully, it is clear that Plutarch continued to enjoy at least some popularity into the early 19th century, even though, again, this is a question of who reads him. And I think even if it is clear that his reading audience was greater in places other than Germany. In the late 18th century, there had been new complete editions in England and Holland, of course, but also in Germany, there was a complete edition by Reiske in the 1770s, together with new translations by Kind and by Schirach in Germany, which is the one um, Schiller reads, followed by a popular translation of the complete works, including the Moralia, by Kaltwasser. And there's an anecdote which, uh, which Ziegler tells, um, and which Hirzel tells as well, that, um, that Goethe found this translation of, of the complete works by Kaltwasser when he was uh, on a on a stay, on a spa stay at Karlsbad, where, where Goethe finds it and where it had been left by Wolf, who had been visiting before. And, uh, th <laughs> and Goethe pounces on this and won't give it up and spends days and days and weeks reading this. But uh, it seems very significant that sort of Wolf happens to forget it there. Um, Ziegler counts four oh. German editions of the lives in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, by Schaeffer, by Simtenis, by Döner, and by Becker. But the next one after that is only that by himself and by Linskog in the, uh, in the 1910s and 1920s, though he adds that there has still been no complete annotated edition of the lives. A certain amount of commentaries on individual lives was produced, though only part of them in Germany, with a center of production clearly in the Netherlands. Of work on the Moralia, according to Ziegler, likewise, there are some but not in extraordinary numbers. Those philologists who did take an interest in Plutarchan problems, and some of them are the ones who produced these editions, uh, who take an interest in Plutarchan philological problems, were mostly associated with Gottfried Hermann. And Hirzel argues for one that this may itself owe to a certain heroism of the great philologist and his editing feats. And we, Hermann is certainly someone who sees himself very much as a kind of hero of textual criticism and was treated as such by his students. One should in this context also point out that many of the Hermannians um, who have an interest in Plutarch either held positions in school teaching or remained very close to that field. Um, and, and Hirzel, who has this uh, monograph about Plutarch and the afterlife of Plutarch, uh, singles out the two philologists Moritz Haupt and Hermann Zaupe, who brought Plutarch back into the canon of school editions. The fact that those two were also Hirzel's own teachers does not only mean that his positive account of Plutarch, and the, the whole book is basically a kind of, it, it ends on a note of, we should be heading towards a Plutarchan Renaissance, um, even though we, we didn't in the end. But this is sort of part of the trajectory of the book. Um, but I think the, that he, the, the fact that he sort of invokes his own teachers in a way is evidence that this is the way forward uh, does not only mean that his positive account of Plutarch owes to his own affiliations, but it shows that an interest in Plutarch was not only a matter of being a school teacher, but a matter of what school one associated with academically. Still, I think the overall picture holds that Plutarch as such was not an overreaching research priority in the 19th century. I want to close on an interesting final case with whom I want to finish, that is that of Jacob Bernays, since in many ways it throws into relief all those areas of the map that I have tried to highlight. Bernays, Fokion und seine neueren Beurteiler, Fokion and his more recent um, judges or evaluators, from 1881, which was his last published work, is not about Plutarch as such, but instead is a short monograph about the Athenian statesman Phocion and his reception. Phocion was well into the early 19th century famous as an exemplar of austerity and known for the support he eventually lent to the Macedonians. Bernays' overall aim is to restore to him a positive evaluation as a figure that allows us an important insight into the role of the philosopher in the city. And this is really a pretty radical sort of redefinition or reinterpretation of, um, 
of Phokion. For Bernays, whose attitude towards democracy of and in the polis was extremely skeptical, Phokion exemplifies the attitude of the philosopher whose character exceeds the confines of the city, who will necessarily end up in conflict with it and who will have to seek political alternatives. Bernays' complex understanding of the philosopher and public intellectual is not my focus here. But what is my focus here is his putting the figure of Phokion center stage in a monograph dedicated only to him, which is a kind of Plutarchan gesture as well. Phokion had enjoyed a reputation as the counterpart to Demosthenes, and this is how he was usually referred to in the, in the 19th century, in the se second half of the 19th century. And as such, he was usually coming in for a fair amount of criticism. To single out a Plutarchan figure in the way Bernays does goes against the grain of scholarly expectations in many ways. He's really talking about Phokion on his own. He's not talking about him in the context of Demosthenes. And he's talking about him in a quasi-Plutarchan manner by dedicating a book just to him and by using a lot of the evidence from Plutarch. Um, it isn't a school text and it is politically provocative and engaged. And it goes back to a kind of earlier Plutarchan tradition of, uh, of reading lives. Uh, I think in this going against the grain, it is also a reflection of his, Bernays' own complex and somewhat marginal standing as a Jew who had deliberately refused conversion to further his career and who had been waiting for a chair for a very, very long time indeed. More importantly, Bernays' attention to the, the Beurteiler, to the recent judges of Phokion, which he really, already in the title, makes a very important part of the book, includes a detailed account of the often highly positive treatment Phokion had received, not only at the hands of French political thinkers in the 18th century, whom Bernays brings back into focus here, like Mabli, but also the interest in Phokion by a range of German scholars around 1800, among them the historian Arnold Heeren in Göttingen, who was Heine's son-in-law, and Heine himself, who both had showed great awareness of Plutarch's value as a biographer and as an author who encourages the engagement with contemporary history and active positioning in terms of political opinion. In this way, Bernays reminds his readers of a possible tradition of reading Plutarch in a scholarly way, yet with an eye to the contemporary world, which is the opposite of the lack of political knowledge and competence of judgment, which he diagnoses amongst his contemporary classics peers. So in other words, a lot of the book is really about the fact that classicists are no longer capable of having strong political opinions and therefore judging Phokion in a, in, in a new and more interesting way. And he really goes back to the, the French model and the model around 1800 to say this is, this is what we have lost. His final comment on the valid analogy between Phokion and Socrates, in terms of them being put to death and in terms of the mistaken judgments of the city, which is an analogy he owes, which is in Plutarch as well. Um, this analogy is even a reminder by him that the Socratic Platonic view of the philosopher in relation to the city does not need to be exclusive. There's, there's room to talk about these issues of the public intellectual by going through Plutarch and not just by going through Plato. In this way, Bernays seems to me to touch on most of the issues I have invoked in trying to localize Plutarch on a map of 19th century scholarship. The neo-humanist focus on classicism and especially on Plato, the standing of the German academic, the fragmentation of Plutarch within historical criticism, the new image the sort of Villamovitian image of an unobjectionable, unobjectionable, domesticated, smooth Plutarch, and the privileging of a recognizable, attractive form with a developmental narrative. In short, here we see reflected some of the, some of the cultural, political, and scholarly institutional reasons that shifted the view away from Plutarch as a research priority and away from him as a model for articulating the position of the reader and now also of the professional scholar of ancient texts. 